So today we're starting with the next topic, which is basically looking at uh, the next type of like social influence on behavior. Now, before we actually look at what that social influence on behavior is, I want you guys to look at this slide and just um, answer this question, which line is the same length as the line X? Okay, so just write that down or just keep that in your head as to what your answer is. Cool, so I'm pretty sure most of you um, said that the, say, the line that was the same as X was B, which is correct. None of you would have said A or C, hopefully. The study that we're looking at today though, talks about how a guy who was shown this particular same question as you was actually kind of forced in a way or pressured to choose the wrong answer, like the answer A or the answer C, because the rest of the people that were in the same room as him answering this question said that the answer was A or said that the answer was C. So he felt like he had to say the same thing as them. And that concept that we talk about and that concept of when we adjust what we think to match what other people think is called conformity. And you would have heard this word before, um, even if before you did psychology, you would understand that conformity is about how we act like other people. How do we match our behavior? How do we match our thoughts? And how do we match our feelings to essentially um, kind of be consistent with or match up to what other people do? or what society does as a whole, okay? Some examples of conformity that you would have seen um, might be, for example, someone who doesn't normally use swear words in a conversation when they're with a certain group of people, because those groups of people use certain words um, like slang or swear words, they start to use them as well. Um, clapping at the end of the speech, even if you're not happy with the speech, even if you thought the speech was extremely boring, you still clap because everyone else claps. Okay, standing in the same direction as everyone else. And there's a really interesting um, video on this, which we would have watched if we were in class, but you can still watch it on YouTube. It's called the elevator experiment. And it's basically a really funny kind of video that shows you um, what happens when you walk into an elevator and everyone is standing facing the door and you stand facing the wall. Will people actually um, start to face the wall as well? Um, because they think that you're correct or that the door is actually on the other side. Um, so it's called the elevator experiment. And it's a really kind of interesting kind of amusing experiment that's been done. And they've done this many times and they found that each time a person gets into an elevator and they face the opposite way that everyone else is facing, everyone else starts to get extremely confused. They start to look at each other. They start to think, okay, are we the ones facing the wrong way? Is the door actually going to open up on the side this guy is um, standing on? So yeah, it's a really interesting um, look into how conformity is so common in society. Um, laughing at a scene in a play. So if you're watching a play or you're watching a movie, um, you know, generally um, we tend to laugh at um, a scene, even if we don't think it's extremely funny because everyone else starts laughing, okay? Or if you've ever been to like a stand-up comedy show or you've watched stand-up comedy, you'd realize that sometimes it just takes a few people to laugh or to um, have a little giggle for the rest of the audience to also start laughing. So that's also conformity. Um, another example, and we'll look at this example later on as well, is that you can sometimes change your style, whether that's your fashion style, whether it's your style, um, whether it's your preferences like music preferences or TV show preferences. You match what you like to match the group that you socialize with. Um, and we'll look at this example a little bit more, but essentially the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you, um, you know, the certain ways in which you um, do things, all of those things can change because of conformity. So that's basically what we're looking at today. Okay, so that's some examples of conformity for you. Now, the main study that I was talking about before um, was the line experiment. Now, before we go into what the line experiment was about, we need to understand why do we conform? Okay, why is it that like blind sheep, we just conform? Why is, why is it that we feel like we have to match our behavior and our thoughts and feelings to the rest of society? Well, number one, a lot of the time we want to we want to be sure that we are seeing the world in the same way that everyone else is seeing it so a lot of the time um, we don't want to stick out we don't want to be the odd ones out we don't want to be extremely different to the extent that we no longer resemble the rest of the people surrounding us in society and so a lot of the time even though we do celebrate uniqueness and we talk about all this um, stuff like oh you know you've got to be your own person you've got to be um, independent you've got to be unique you know um, all that stuff 
we do conform, okay? We do conform to an extent because we do want to feel, number one, accepted, and we do want to feel a sense of belonging. And if you're going to be so unique that you become an odd one out or you stick out like a sore thumb in society, you're not going to get that sense of belonging. In fact, you're going to feel like a sense of exclusion. You're going to feel like you're an outcast. So for that reason, we do conform. Okay, and we're going to look at other reasons as to why we conform a little bit later in the PowerPoint. So looking at the actual study that we're going through today, Solomon Ash's study on conformity. So Solomon Ash was the guy who essentially conducted this experiment. And he was interested in figuring out, can conformity occur even in an unambiguous un un situation? So obviously, um, you know, if someone's wearing a nice, um, a nice jacket, and the rest of the group decides to wear the nice jacket, I might decide to buy that jacket as well, okay? That's not ambiguous, that's pretty obvious um, of a situation. What about a situation where you, as a person, are 100% sure that this line is the same length as number two, okay? And you know 100% that that is the correct answer, and you want to say, okay, this is the subject in the experiment. You want to say that the correct answer is number two, but everyone else in the group is saying number three, line number three, line number three, line number three. Okay, and then it comes to you. What are you going to say? Are you going to say line number three, conforming and matching your answer to match that of the group? Or are you going to stick to your guns and are you going to say, no, I believe the answer is number two. I don't know what these guys are talking about. So what Solomon Asher's study was is essentially this. This was the basic idea of his entire study. Put a bunch of guys in the room, all of them being males, um, all of these are confederates, okay? So all of these guys, including this guy as well, well, this is the experimenter, all of these guys are confederates. I'll put a C on top of them. Now remember, if you remember what confederates are from the previous lesson, a confederate is a fake subject, okay? They're a subject that are in on the study. They're working with Ash, the experimenter, to basically um, participate in the study, but they know what the study is about. This guy is the only guy that they took from outside who has no idea what the study is about. He's the innocent guy who's just brought into the study and he doesn't know that these guys are fake participants. He doesn't know that these guys are working with Ash. He doesn't know that these guys are in on the study. He thinks that these guys, these four guys here, are just similar to him, just participants that were taken from outside. So that's why he's confused. He's like, okay, if these guys all think the line is three, is this a trick question? Do I need to be looking at it more clearly? And you can see the way that he's looking at the image there very closely to figure out why they've said number three and whether he should say number three as well. Okay, so that's essentially the main idea of the study. It was such a simple study, but such a powerful study. And it's been replicated thousands of times um, since it was first established in the 1950s. Okay, so we're gonna look at it in a little bit more detail now. So obviously the question asked was this, uh, which line is the same as X, okay? And Ash actually conducted this study two times. So he conducted it in 1951, which is the black and white picture you see here. This was the first run of the study, the original study. And the second run of the study that he did was in 1956, so five years later, to see whether the results would be the same. In both these years, the results were essentially consistent with each other. There were similar results that were obtained. Um, now, obviously, the subject, so I'll just circle who the subject or the innocent subject is in each of these. I call them innocent because they don't really know what's happening and they just kind of think that all the other subjects are like them. So this was the subject in um, 1951 study. This was the subject in the 1956 study. So you can see in both of these studies, in both of these pictures, they're almost seated last in the list or last in the table there. So they have to give their answer after each of these guys have already given the wrong answer. So there's more pressure there to conform because the previous few guys have already given the wrong answer. Same on this top picture here. These previous guys have already given their answer and then it comes to the subject, okay? So all of these guys are confederates, fake subjects, okay? So just remember that. And the only real subject or the real participant taken from outside who's not in on the study is this guy, is the subject and this guy who is the subject in the second study. Now, the naive subject who is the, you know, the innocent subject is brought into the lab with six to eight confederates. Now, confederates are fake participants. They're all asked to make a decision about the length of the line. So which line is identical to line X? The subject is seated next to the last or second last participant. So like I said before, there's a big pressure to conform because four people or five people have already given their answer and they've all said the wrong answer. So now you're double guessing yourself as the subject. 
Now, in 12 of the 18 trials, Confederates do provide the wrong answer. So the Confederates say, okay, the answer is um, A. Okay, the line that's the same as X is A. That's the wrong answer. And so the DV, or what we were measuring for change in this study, is whether the subject, aka our innocent participant here, is going to follow the same incorrect answer as the others, knowing well and truly that that answer is wrong. Now, ordinarily, subjects do make mistakes about 1% of the time, but in this experiment, they started to make mistakes 37% of the time because their conformity started to increase. They started to match their answer to be um, consistent with what everyone else said. And obviously, what everyone else said was the wrong answer. So that is a really quick summary of what the um, conformity experiment was about. Some videos for you to watch in the, um, you know, in the next time you've got some free time um, or in the next offline session. So this is the original ASH study footage. The modern remake of ASH study is very interesting and the animated explanation of the experiment. So if you watch all three of these, you will be um, really, really well informed about this study. It's a pretty, these are pretty straightforward. So just watch them and that'll be um, good for you. We would have normally watched them in class, but um, yeah. Okay, so Asha's result summary. So just a quick summary of the results. 33% um, went along with the group's incorrect answer. So um, generally when we're looking at the subject, about 33% of the time they did go along with the group's incorrect answer, knowing that it was incorrect. 24% of the subjects in the study remained completely independent on their own answers, sticking to their gun, saying that, you know what, I, I don't think that these guys are correct. I'm going to stick to my own answer. 75% of the participants overall conformed to the group at least once. Now, you have to remember that when these subjects were tested alone, so let's say I'm Ash, I'm the experimenter, I take this guy into a room and I say, okay, I'm not going to let any of the other confederates into the room. It's only going to be the subject me and the subject and I'm asking the subject, okay, what do you think the answer actually was? In this case, because there's no one else around them to pressure them, there's no other guys in the room, he's gonna be more likely to give me the correct answer, the answer that he actually thought was correct initially before changing it to match the group. And this was supported by um, Ash's results because in um, the testing alone condition, when there were no Confederates around him, the subject actually got more than 98% of the judgments correct. So almost 100% of the time. Okay. But in comparison to this, when tested with Confederates, with all the guys around him, they only got 66% of the judgments correct. So this shows us how the presence of other people can pressure us to conform. And in Asher's studies condition, can actually pressure you to give the wrong answer when you well and truly know that um, your answer was correct in your mind, but you can't say it out loud because you don't want to go against the group. Okay, so that's essentially the summary of results of Asher's study. Now, why do we conform? We're relating this back to our real life implications now, relating it back to the actual topic of conformity. We conform because um, we don't want to stick out. We've already talked about this. We don't want to be the odd ones out. Now, after Asher's study was complete, when Ash was debriefing and talking to the participants after the study was done, all of the participants mentioned that at some point or the other, they started to doubt their answer or opinion. They started to actually look closely. They were like looking at the um, lines, like, is this a trick question? Am I not looking at it closely? You know, this guy was taking his glasses off, putting his glasses on probably, trying to see, okay, am I missing something here? Now, those participants who conform with the answer given by the Confederates, they said that they knew they were wrong, but they conformed because they wanted to go along with the group. They didn't want to spoil the experimenter's results. So again, we can see an experimenter effect coming up here. They're acting um, in line with the experimenter's expectations. And they didn't want to create any conflict or lack of harmony. Because if everyone is saying that line three is the longest and you think that it's line two, if you say line two, there's going to be a bit of discussion opening up. There's going to be a bit of conflict there. And this guy didn't want that to happen. So obviously, as people, we generally want to agree with the group because we don't want to create conflict or we want to maintain the peace. Now, some of the participants who did remain insistent on giving the correct response and not conforming, these were the more kind of confident, maybe headstrong participants, mentioned that when they said that it was line two, when they went against the group, they actually felt guilty. Some even went so far as to say, sorry, guys, I think it's actually line two. They actually apologized because they felt so guilty for going against the group. Other participants felt, said that they felt like outcasts or misfits for actually giving an answer that was completely different to what everyone else was saying. So this again shows you 
how Asher's study um, demonstrates this idea of conformity. So this is just a little storyboard kind of thing I found online and I just thought I'd post it up here. It just, it's just like a little comic strip that just essentially summarizes what the ASH study was about. Um, okay, so just a quick summary that you can read through just to give you a kind of more animated um, idea of what it's about. All right, the factors affecting conformity. So we're just gonna go through these really quickly. They're really straightforward. These are the factors that in addition to what we've already talked about as to what can influence conformity, these are other factors that can also influence our tendency to conform or to match our thoughts, feelings and behavior to that of another personal group. Um, you can use the memory tip I see dungs to remember this and it's actually kind of hard to make, make up a memory tip for this. Um, so hopefully you remember it like this. So I, so I for informational influence, C for culture, D for de-individuation, U for unanimity, N for normative influence, G for group size and S for social loafing. And that is a dung beetle next to dung. So those of you who know what dung is, we all know what dung is. Okay, so enough about dung. Let's just get on with the uh, influences. So the factors influencing conformity, the first one is I. So our memory tip is I see dung. So I for, inf for informational influence. Informational influence means that we're more likely to conform when we don't have enough information about a particular um, thing. So for example, if you're in maths class and you're not really good with... Um, um, differentiation or you're not very good with um, algebra okay if someone um, if someone writes a question on the board and they write an incorrect answer to that and then they ask the rest of the class okay guys what do you think about my answer and everyone else is the same as you they don't have much of an idea of how to answer this question everyone might just say oh yeah we think it's correct and because you don't have a lot of information on how to solve that problem yourself you're also going to say that oh you're also going to go along with the group and say oh yeah that's correct because you don't have a lot of information yourself, okay, about that specific um, task or about that specific situation. Now, usually we're affected by informational influence when we don't have enough information about something, or if we're just simply unsure ourselves about what something could be, okay? So those are the two things. So let's say if you go to a new country and um, you're not sure about some of the um, directions or some of the uh, local customs of how to get somewhere or of how to do something, um, you might ask somebody or you might just do what the rest of the locals are doing, okay, because you think that that's the right thing to do. You don't have enough information to act on your own devices or to act by your own will in that case. So in um, research studies that have been conducted, um, they've found that informational influence is more likely to influence the ability to which, um, sorry, the extent to which you conform when you feel incompetent, when you don't feel like you're competent in something, when a task is difficult for you to do, for example, a difficult maths question, or when you're concerned about whether you're right or wrong. So all of that can actually influence your um, conformity when it comes to informational influence. Okay, so informational influence is going along with others because their ideas and behavior make sense and you don't have enough evidence or enough knowledge yourself to make your own decision. Okay, and a lot of the time, people who are not, um, people who don't have enough information to do something will often use informational influence as a guiding force for their conformity there. The next one is C, so C for culture, the highest level of conformity. And we've looked at this when we looked at um, social cognition in chapter nine and the role of culture. It's the same idea that people from collectivist cultures where the group is kind of glorified and group goals are put ahead of personal goals, like for example, China, they will actually show more conformity compared to um, countries or cultures where uh, independence and individuality are valued like Australia or America or, or a lot of your Western countries for that matter. Okay, so essentially in individualist cultures, people who conform are kind of seen negatively. They're kind of seen as being kind of like blind sheep um, and conformity is not seen as a good quality to have. Whereas in countries like China, people who conform are actually seen as the ideal person, the person you want to be like. And people who don't conform in countries like China or um, you know North Korea for that matter, um, essentially they are um, punished for not conforming, okay? Because in some countries, not conforming can actually lead to, um, you know, uh, you getting arrested or putting into put to jail or fined even, okay? So that's essentially the role of culture. Um, the role of de-individuation. So de-individuation is basically the loss of individuality. So de meaning kind of loss of individual individuation about individuality. So de-individuation is the loss of individuality um, when you become a part of a group. So when you become a part of a group and everyone is saying that we want this, 
you might not want that particular thing in your head, but because you're a part of the group, you lose your voice. You, use, you lose your individual voice there. And deindividuation is one of the reasons why, um, you know, when you see protests or rallies or mob behavior or riots in the street, um, people generally, when they're in a group, they lose their sense of individuality. They feel like they're less accountable for. Like, who's going to see me screaming at this, um, you know, screaming in this big group here? Um, and you become less of an individual and more of a member of an actual group. Okay, so deindividuation involves two other social behaviors, the first one being shift in attention and the second one being anonymity in a group. Now, shift in attention is that when you're in a group, your attention is focused um, on the activities that are external to you or that are happening outside you. And whatever you have inside you in terms of your own thoughts or what's running through your mind um, kind of gets pushed to the side. So fewer opportunities for internal thoughts and more focus on what's happening outside. And that's why people who are um, often in groups like protests or rallies or mobs um, or street riots, they tend to act more impulsively and in line with what the group expects. They don't focus on what they're thinking themselves. Anonymity in a group is what I just said before. So when people feel anonymous or invisible and less accountable for their actions, they may choose to conform to a group which is behaving in ways they otherwise would not. So being part of a large crowd or un being unrecognizable, if you're wearing some sort of disguise, um, you might start to do things that you would not normally think about doing. Okay, so if you've watched um, that Netflix show, um, what is it called, Money Heist, um, that is like a show where, you know, when they wear that costume, no matter what who you are, when you wear that costume, you are de-identified. You lose that sense of individuality and you become a part of that group that supports that cause or that supports that political ideology there. Okay, so essentially the bigger the group is, the greater the anonymity is going to be and the lower the chances of you being exposed for who you are are going to be as well. So that's de-individuation. And we are more likely to conform when we're in a group situation because there's less chance of us getting caught or less chance of us being exposed. Unanimity is essentially agreement by all people. You would have heard the word unanimous. So the decision has to be unanimous, means that everyone has to agree with the decision, okay? Um, now, in the psychology, um, in the study that Ash conducted, um, unanimity was a big factor as to influencing the subject and whether the subject would also agree with the answer given by the group. Um, so generally, if at least one other subject conformed, I'm um, sorry, if at least one other subject disagreed and said, you know what, I agree with this guy. I think that the answer is actually wrong. Um, the subject was more likely to feel comfortable in giving their own response. So a lack of unanimity leads to less conformity, but the presence of unanimity leads to more conformity. Okay, so just remember that. Alrighty, so that's what unanimity is about. Unanimity is a driving force for conformity because if everyone else is doing something in a particular way and it's in a unanimous way, then it's going to be hard for you to break the mold there and stick out like a sore thumb by doing something different. And normative influence is like I showed you at the beginning of the lesson. Um, when you've got like, you know, certain social norms, whether that's um, in the social group that you're um, hanging around with or whether that's in general society, we tend to be guided by social norms and we conform our behavior or our thoughts or our feelings to be in line with those social norms. So when you're talking about, um, you know, this picture here, this girl originally was wearing a different kind of, um, you know, she had a different fashion style, but when she saw um, this other group of girls who are all wearing kind of like striped um, jumpers, she also decides to come and wear that as well and, you know, hang out with them the next day. So essentially she's conformed to actually change her behavior, change her style to match that of another group, which is essentially conforming through normative influences. Normative influence suggests that we conform because we want to be liked and accepted by other people and we don't want to be rejected by other people. And like I said at the beginning, normative influence is one of the biggest um, driving forces for conformity for most people. Okay, We want to be conformed because we don't want to stick out and we want to be socially approved of and socially accepted. Group size. So group size is also a big factor when we're talking about group size. Um, the more the people the more people that are in a particular group, the more likely you are to conform with them. But too much of a, uh, like a really big group size can also produce lower levels of conformity. And why this happens is because when you increase a group size to 15, for example, in Asha's study, there's gonna be a higher chance of people within that having individual differences. 
And so because of that, there's more likely to be a higher number of people that actually disagree with the group. And there is enough of a number of participants there to then disagree with the group and to then say, you know what, we don't agree with this as compared to maybe three confederates versus one subject, okay? Where it's more likely that the three will agree with each other because three is a much smaller number and there's less room for individual differences there. Okay, so that's essentially group size. And you can see the graph here that as the group size increases, the best group size for conform that showed the most conformity was about um, eight people, I think, yeah? Yeah, about eight people. So if you've got seven confederates or eight confederates and one subject, eight confederates, one subject, that is the most, um, that's gonna produce the most conformity and put the most pressure on the one subject to um, match their answer to be um, similar to that of the other eight confederates. So remember group size is dependent on how big the group is because when we have too much of a big group size, it can actually lead to less conformity. Um, the best number is about eight people. And the last thing is social loafing. So social loafing is this idea that when you're in a group, um, you're more likely to, um, when you're in a group, um, the tendency of you to actually put in more effort is going to be um, less compared to when you're working alone. So this is basically the idea that when you're doing some group work, there's always like a few people that are putting in 110% effort and a few people that are being lazy. Okay, how do we link this now to conformity? Well, it's basically social loafers, people who are lazy when it comes to group work, people who let everyone else do the work, tend to conform to their group. What they say is that, you know, they're basically, um, if, this, if these two people in the group come up to them and say, okay, what do you think about this particular um, idea? They'll be like, yeah, 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 do whatever. Like, I'm happy with everything, okay? They conform to the group because it's the easiest thing to do. They would rather just conform and accept and go along with what the group is doing because they've got to put less effort that way. If they bring up a new idea, then they have to explain the idea. They have to start doing some extra work. Okay, so that's why a lot of the time when you're working in a group, if you've got a lazy person, you'll realize that lazy person is the social loafer in your group. And they're the ones that will always say something like, oh, yeah, I'm happy with what you guys are doing. Just continue. Um, and, you know, I'll just, I'll just sit here kind of thing. Yeah, so social loafers tend to show more conformity to the group um, because essentially they know that whether they conform or don't conform, it's not going to make much of a difference. They're just kind of sitting there letting everyone else do the work. Okay, so that's about it for today. So please make sure that you complete the questions for this particular spread. They're on the social, um, on the course outline, sorry. I'll post that up in the social stream as well when I post the recording. Um, but that's about it for today. So um, you guys can go ahead and just revise the PowerPoint. Watch those three video links that I posted on the slides a few slides back. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Yeah. Okay, that's it for today. Bye, everybody. Bye.